excited about this uh, talk until uh, just a couple minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, I mean, somebody came up to me and said, is Bill Nye your real name? And I said, well, it's William Nye. And he said, well, why did you change it? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, hi. Yes. Uh, I open this. It's gonna. They're safe. <laughs> oh, cool. Oh, look at this. I mean, like, come on. <laughs>
and the cop pulls him over and wants to know what he's doing. I'm taking pictures of you, no, sir, it's a highway. <laughs> they had there a total board of the world's population. And my parents and, uh, and I missed it just changing. We were a couple hours behind. It changing from 2,999,999,999 people in the world to 3 billion people in the world. All right, in my lifetime, since 1964, <laughs> the world's population as of this morning, I captured this number this morning, is well over 7 billion, seven, almost 7.2 billion people. It's more than doubled in my lifetime. That is the problem. Much as I love people, <laughs> there are a lot of them. And, uh, and we, everybody, if you go to the develop, developing world, everybody wants to live the way we live in the developed world. Everybody wants phones. I mean, this plane is missing, right? Which is uh, a bad thing. Malaysia Airlines 370 is missing. And you'll meet many people. I can't understand this. Don't they have Twitter? Where are those people? Where's Facebook? What's going on? Well, when you're in some parts of the world, there's not, there just, it isn't there. But everybody in those parts of the world wants it to be there. And, you know, you can go to Western China and meet people who have never made a phone call. Not never made a cell phone call. Never made a phone call. And these people want to live the way we live in the developed world. They want to drive cars, they want computers, they want all the fabulous fast food and so on. And uh, this is putting stress on the Earth's environment. So you may be familiar with this graph. This is uh, the graph of the world's temperature over the last thousand years, compiled nominally by Michael Mann, who's now at Penn State. He had to leave the Commonwealth of Virginia because the Commonwealth of Virginia Attorney General was suing him for studying the Earth's climate with company dollar, uh, state tax dollars. And this is the famous hockey stick. So this uh, a brown line represents the shaft of a hockey stick. And so the world's temperature has been about the same the last thousand years. But the last 250 years, the world's temperature has gotten uh, warmer very fast. So everybody, it's not that the world is getting warmer. It's not that the world may have been warmer some other time. It's the speed, it's the rate that the world is getting warmer. That is the hassle. So by the way, full disclosure, Michael Mann's book just came out in paperback. And uh, full disclosure, I wrote the, uh, the foreword. So are there any professors here? Yeah, I just want to point out, okay, if you have a laser pointer and you go like this, it doesn't help anybody. <laughs> Determining the Earth's climate nominally with, I mean, mainly with ice cores, but also with the rings in trees. In warmer seasons, the rings, the trees grow faster, the rings are farther apart. Pollen in the sediments of lakes and ponds, and so on. And we've taken it back now 10,000 years. And so this little brown line up here, <laughs> this one right here, is the shaft of the hockey stick from the previous graph. And now we have this uh, going back 10,000 years, and it was warmer, there was more carbon dioxide, but now they call it the sickle instead of the hockey stick because it's going up so fast. That's the problem. It's not that it's been warmer or colder or anything, or it's been going on, uh, it, it's, it's been going on for millennia, but now it's happening so fast. So I just want to point out that I go way back with this. Uh, I wrote my first kid's book uh, back in 1993. Yes, it was when, um, 1993 was when Nirvana's uh, first album, I guess. Is that right, 93? Uh, and so in this book, this, this guy looks just like me, only sort of half my age. 
uh, I had this proposal where you would take time and, and do your own uh, carbon dioxide atmosphere. It's a model. It's not the atmosphere is not pure carbon dioxide. You would notice that right away. <laughs> Uh, and then a couple years ago, I did a very similar demonstration on stuff happens. And what I say to everybody, what you want to do is show. You want to show and then tell. This is very hard to do because what we all want to do is just explain it. Just as you start talking and just get it done. Just move on. But my claim is that when you can see it, uh, that's when it becomes compelling. That's when you get it. And then you see it, and then you wonder what happened, and then somebody, it is to be hoped, will explain it to you. So along this line, this goes back, this, the bottom one goes back to 1993. This one's about 1994. This was uh, 2007 and 8. And it's the same message. And people are still having, in the United States especially, are still having a great deal of trouble embracing the idea of climate change. And I get it. I mean, I get it. If you are the senator from Oklahoma, uh, you grew up where your neighbors are literally kilometers or miles away from you, you it's literally incredible to you that humans could change the population of, all, of the, the climate of a whole planet. The human population could change the climate of a whole planet. It just doesn't seem feasible. But the problem is, it's more than, the human population is more than doubled in my lifetime, and the atmosphere is extraordinarily thin. So I've done my best in the last few minutes just to show you those couple images. You know, if you had the right car on some extraordinary road, and you could drive straight up for uh, two hours, well, the way people drive in Missouri, about 45 minutes. <laughs> And you'd be in outer space. And so the, the outer space is extraordinarily close to us. And that, that's the problem. The thin atmosphere of 7 billion people going on 12 billion people. And at the same time, here in the United States, what is the main thing we export? The main thing we export in the United States, you could say airplanes, which are cool. They're billions and billion dollar deals all the time. But the main thing we export, export is our culture. People all over the world watch U.S. movies, U.S. television. To a limited extent, they listen to U.S. podcasts and stuff. But there's a movie coming out called Noah, where this guy from the Bible, who looks just like Russell Crowe, <laughs> <laughs> runs around and, and um, the earth is drowned and all the uh, significant organisms are saved by getting just two of them on an ark that floats somehow for a year with no windows, and everybody else drowns. They're cool. And this is because this is to atone for some, uh, something we did wrong. And this wouldn't matter except people are going to think that this is what people think. And by that I mean the myth of Noah comes from a society that lived where there were floods. I'm sure. Rivers flooded, and so they came up with their fabulous flood myth. Many societies came up with that. You know, more power to them. But that's not factual, I don't think, not worldwide. And as you may know, I got in a little discussion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, why not? So, uh, this guy who claims he believes the earth is 6,000 years old challenged me to a duel. <laughs> and I went around for a while and I was able to hone it so that it was whether or not his creation model was viable. That was his, his uh, adjective. And his Ken Ham shown here, there's what's his name over here. And, uh, you know, I did what I, what I could to show, not him, I mean, I'm not going to change his mind, or his congregation probably not change their minds. The problem is that these people are running around in what used to be the world's technological leader in our society, at a time when we have these extraordinary problems that have to be solved. 
We have these uh, 7 billion people who are going on 12 billion, and we have climate change. So we don't want to raise a generation of people that don't accept the process of science, let alone the body of knowledge of science, and, uh, and leave the world worse than we found it. So this is an example from a dear friend of mine, Don Prothero. Now, if you're in the audience and you can understand this, I don't know who you are. So if you're a professor here and you got this, all I got to do is very new version, Philip Henry. You got to do the theory. If you fix it, you can buy it. What? What? So apparently, to some people who are creationists, one of the great challenges is um, Adam and Eve, uh, who are from the Bible, are supposed to. Uh, did they have belly buttons? This is, you know, a deep question for some people. For some people. So he has all these words, and then he brings this picture in. And you'll see, yeah, they, yeah, I know, they have no um, genitalia, but they do have belly buttons. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, I know, it's extraordinary. Yeah, it's, you're probably never going to meet anybody like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> my point being that the guy presenting this, in my opinion, there's, two, there's more than you can absorb. It's, it's more than you can get if you're sitting in the audience. And you can argue, well, these are college students. They're supposed to be able to read. But they can't read while you're talking, in my opinion. And so it's my claim that many of my scientific colleagues, if I can be a scientist as well as an engineer, uh, do this a lot, where you present all this information which you strongly believe is proof of whatever it is you're trying, the point you're trying to make. But it's more than the listener or observer or a classroom person can get. So I took the liberty of taking this map from Ken Ham's website. And it's just, you're not going to find that many maps, everybody, that depict England, call attention to England, and Utah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, it might happen. I mean, no, really. It's just, and not, you know, you'll notice there's still this thing going on. Scotland doesn't get anything. You know, Wales, you know, Britain, it's not the UK. No, it's England. And then, it's not the American West or the Great Basin or the Frontage Range or the Benchlands. No, it's Utah itself. So I pointed out to Mr. Ham and his audience, and Mr. Ham, of course, isn't going to, it's not going to do anything for him, but... The people like you who are watching on the TV, the computer machine that the kids use. Uh, I pointed out that if if this ark had landed in Mon Mount Ararat, uh, you would expect to find kangaroo fossils or kangaroos in Vietnam or Laos or someplace, but there aren't any. And so uh, this to me would be enough to like turn the whole thing on its head. And I'm hoping that as the years go on, and people watch that video enough that eventually the United States, the world's leader in technology and science, will discard this and not um, let this be the image we present to the world. So, uh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so another, another remarkable thing, which can be troubling or empowering, is uh, this discovery of how many ancestors we modern humans have. It really is amazing. But what would, you, yeah, what would you guys be doing if you weren't here? That's right, you'd be watching CSI Columbia or something. Do they have that, do they have that, that St. Louis now? And so pretty soon they're gonna have one just for yeah, downtown, just for the one. <laughs> So uh, this one I like, uh, the Man CS2 is pretty good. Uh, does anybody know where we are? We're down here at the bottom. And then this one with the really small brain case here, that's, uh, I think that's my old boss. <laughs> and I know this, this presentation affected people because somebody went out of their way, in the rain, to put this on their, on their Dodge Caravan. I know, I know. So somehow I'm lying about all this and everything's fine. Just take my word for it. I mean, it's just, 
it would be okay. But this is a family vehicle. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And I think there's probably a family with young people in there who are going to be brought up with this extraordinary view of the world, and they will not be successful scientists and engineers. And as I like to point out, there are billions of people in the world who are deeply religious and embrace it, and they get great sense of community and wonder from their affiliation with uh, whatever religious branch of religion they're into. But the earth is not 6,000 years old. It just can't be. And so we just can't let this idea uh, We can't let this idea get too far out there. So, uh, by the way, everybody, in the U.S. Constitution is, to, is the charge to the U.S. Congress to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. So I can, I'm an engineer, and you can, you can probably tell. Uh, you usually recognize us at parties. <laughs> so, pants don't reach the floor. But still, they still want you at the party. That's the thing. <laughs> hey, you're an engineer. Hey, man. Um, can you fix the blender? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, so tell you what. Um, sure, uh, get the plug, hold, hold it in the wall firmly, and then put the blender under some cold running water. <laughs> oh, God. See, that's only funny if you're scientifically literate. <laughs> Oh, for some reason I threw this in here. I, uh, I guess it's because I was talking about engineering and presentation of information. I will say that right here, I used this one. The, the, the main boat drawing is from that website, from that guy's website. Uh, and he's got Noah's Ark there uh, with some other wooden ships that were built. The detail he left out about the, U, about the Wyoming six-masted wooden vessel is it sank. <laughs> it's kind of, it's an important detail, because uh, it twisted, and apparently it's very difficult to build uh, lumber, wooden lumber ships that uh, hold together. And all 14 crewmen were lost at sea, miserable, but the premise of the bid is that he was going to have 14,000 animals all running around safely for a year. You know, I mean, I'm open-minded, of course, but it didn't happen. And so I will say that this, this graphic is a little too busy. If you're watching on the website, you can get it. If you're there trying to make a point, maybe you can get it. But I think there's a little too much going on. So uh, let's say instead that this uh, picture of the sun represents uh, the sun. <laughs> and then uh, this will represent the Earth. And it's one astronomical unit, one AU from the sun. Now that's an average. And AU is a very easy thing to remember. You go up to an astronomer and you go, AU! <laughs> How far is the Earth from the sun? And then he or she will say, one AU! And then see, there you go. It's uh, 150 million kilometers, 93 million miles. Then let's say, um, this is the, uh, this picture of Mercury represents Mercury. It's 40% of the distance, 0.4 AU. Then Venus is 0.7 AU. And Mars is 1.5 AU uh, and, and on average. And so these sm relatively small changes in this one number uh, affect everyone on Earth. Now, if those of you, I see a lot of young people in the audience, you will remember it easily. Some of the older people, I hope you'll reach back and remember playing this game where you can't step on the floor <laughs> because it's like lava. <laughs> and then you can't drink out of the sink because that's like acid. <laughs> It'll kill you. Well, let me tell you something. On Venus, it's really like that. <laughs> <laughs> on Venus, it's 90,000 atmospheres. Uh, 90 atmospheres, 90,000 hectopascals, or HEPs. And a hectopascal is the same unit as a millibar for the older people. It's, it's the System International version. Hectopascal. 
So this was taken by a Russian Venera spacecraft, which survived on the surface of Venus for a little less than an hour, but it allowed them to send back this, this picture. It's amazing. So if you were there on the surface of Venus, and you had your fishing weights, let's say, or your old-fashioned uh, toy soldiers, they would melt. It's hot enough to melt lead. But wait, wait, there's more. Uh, the clouds of Venus are literally sulfuric acid. Like, dude, what? Yeah, there's sulfuric acid. It rains sulfuric acid on Venus. But the rain doesn't make it to the ground because the ground is so hot, the rain evaporates before it gets to the surface. It's this extraordinary sulfur acid cycle. By Western standards, Venus is like hell. We don't want to be like Venus, and at least most of us. And uh, uh, the reason is there's just too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now having uh, an atmosphere that's 90 times the density of the Earth, makes it uh, thick, resistant. There is a tidal interaction between the atmosphere of Venus and the spin of Venus. Uh, we have the ocean in the Earth, but our atmosphere isn't that thick. If we go to Mars, which is extraordinarily cold, you know, it's about, uh, on a summer day, it'll be freezing, zero Celsius right at the surface, and here it'll be 20 below, and here it'll be 40 below, because the atmosphere is so crazy thin. Uh, so the atmosphere, as we say, is uh, too thin to help you, but too thick to ignore. That's why landing on Mars is so difficult. This is a trace of the path of the Curiosity rover over the last few months, taken with pictures from a satellite in orbit around Mars. I mean, you guys, it's really extraordinary to put satellites in orbit around another planet and take pictures of the surface. I mean, if you told my grandfather you were doing it, he'd go, are you drunk? Like, what are you doing? It's not possible. Anyway, when you look at Mars, which has an atmosphere much, much thinner than the Earth's and extraordinarily thinner than the Venusian atmosphere. Oh yeah, um, adjectives that talk about Venus, uh, things that have the characteristics or, or pertain to Venus, the adjective now is Venusian. In the 19th century, that adjective was venereal. <laughs> so they had to uh, change it. Because uh, it was the planet of the. <laughs> Mars, you say Martian for Mars. If you look at the Martian surface, you can see craters. Like there's one, and uh, there's another one. And, you know, really, if you look not even closely, there's a lot of them. <laughs> there's just a lot of craters. And so those, it is reasonable that the same thing that happened on Mars and the same thing that happens on Venus happens here on Earth. And that's really the essence of science, you guys, is to find natural laws that are true everywhere. So it could be that if Mars has been struck by all these uh, objects leaving these enormous craters and it has carbon dioxide which keeps its keeps it that world just a little bit warmer than it would be otherwise Venus has carbon dioxide that keeps it extraordinarily warmer than it would be otherwise and we have a little bit of carbon dioxide that keeps us just warm enough these principles are true everywhere and so what I want you all to consider the young people especially it is the chance that the Earth will get hit with an asteroid. And I'm not joking you. So this is uh, Meteor Crater, Arizona. If you've never been there, it is amazing. You get out of your car and you walk up this little hill and you go through these doors and there's a Subway sandwich shop right there. It really is. And you walk along and you come out to there through another set of doors. And there's this hole! There's this enormous hole! It's a mile wide. It's a... Uh, 200 some meters, 550 feet deep, and it was made by an impact tour, we figure about 25,000 years ago. Now, when I was in astronomy class, back in the 1970s, it was when uh, disco was just giving way to, uh, to punk, and you know, the important work of uh, Sid Vicious and the Sex Pistols. <laughs> <laughs> 
I've spoken. It's not for me. It's for the kids. It's for the young people. Anyway, my old professor, Carl Sagan, used to talk quite a bit about the Tunguska event. And people didn't really have uh, an especially great explanation for it other than it must have been uh, something that came from the sky and exploded. Well, since then, a lot of work's been done on meteor impacts and so on, meteorite impacts. And apparently, you know, you may have heard this story, if you jump off the Golden Gate Bridge, the water will be like concrete and it will kill you. And that's nominally true. Uh, yes, don't do that. Uh, so apparently if you're a rock or a block of ice coming into the Earth's atmosphere, the atmosphere cannot get out of the way fast enough and you just explode. And so when you do, you create this air burst and you knock down trees for 100 kilometers in every direction, which is what happened in Siberia. Now, if you're, by the way, if you're an asteroid and you're coming in to hit the Earth from the north, there's a good chance you'll hit Russia. Uh, just for your expectations. <laughs> Russia's 11, it used to be 11 time zones wide. They did some, it's now nine time zones, but it's, it's huge. It's most of the northern, uh, the polar region. Anyway, uh, <coughs> you guys were all here last year when uh, the Chelyabinsk mm -hmm. object hit uh, Chelyabinsk, Russia, and exploded in the sky. And there's so much insurance fraud there, everybody has a camera on their dashboard. <laughs> weird. But they got uh, dozens and dozens of pictures of this thing streaking through the sky. People go up to the windows looking at the streak, wow, that's cool. Then almost three minutes later, the sonic booms, the shock waves, hit the ground and blow out the windows. A thousand people go to the hospital. Uh, and then that same night, or this, in the course of the next uh, 24 hours, uh, another asteroid came between the Earth and the global positioning satellites, and that one was quite a bit bigger, 2012 day 14, if you're scoring on with us. And if that had hit anywhere, it would utterly change the world. I mean, it would utterly change the world. I'll claim that asteroid uh, deflection is the only preventable natural disaster. It is the one. And I want you, young people here, to save the world. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure, yes, yeah, save the world, yes. Yeah. So it may be, this is a fun little science fiction problem for you all. You know, we at the Planetary Society, I'm now, this, see, you guys, Carl Sagan started the Planetary Society back in 1980. And I got on a mailing list because I had gone to school there, and I joined, and it was big fun. And then. Um, when Carl Sagan died, I spoke, I was asked to speak at his memorial, and that was quite an honor, it was cool. Then I was asked to be on the board of directors. And I did that for several years, along with my, seriously you guys, my very good friend, Neil Tyson. Woo! He knocked a few back, I mean. <laughs> um, anyway, then... Uh, something happened, I left the room or something, or maybe there was wine, and now, uh, now I'm the CEO. <laughs> uh, it's not really clear on what happened, but we promote this idea because it's a real thing. Now this is, here's a fun little science, science fiction thing for you to consider. Maybe the reason we have never heard from another civilization, the planetary side still listens for search for extraterrestrial intelligence, an extraterrestrial signal. Uh, maybe the reason we've never heard from anybody is you have to pass the asteroid test. Maybe you have to have two superpowers who are fighting it out, and then you have to have a moon. And you said, I'll race you to the moon. Okay. And then you go to the moon and you mess around and you end up with a space program. And then when you find an asteroid with your name on it, you can go out there and just give it a little push. And if you don't have the two superpowers and the moon, then you don't get it done. Mrs. McGonagall, my second grade teacher, uh, read to us from a book. And this is a book that, if I may, the man gave her to read. And, and dinosaurs died out because they had small brains. So the mammals took all their food and they died. <laughs> And even she knew that was just lame. <laughs> I'm, I'm a Tyrannosaurus. You are a rabbit. <laughs> I mean, 
But in my lifetime, we found this crater on Chicxulub, Mexico, that is almost certainly evidence of the asteroid impact which killed the ancient dinosaurs, or contributed to their demise, certainly. So we do not want to go the route of the ancient dinosaurs. So you'd say, what do you do? Run in circles screaming? No. Do you send Bruce Willis? No. <laughs> I love the guy, but no, because you don't want to blow it up. Because then you're going to have a shower of these objects, and you may, you know, in outer space things are complicated. You may make a few of them hit even sooner or harder or worse. So you might go out there and park your spaceship on the asteroid, and then turn on the rocket engine, you know. Because you want to give it a nudge, just a little nudge. But it's in outer space, so there's no sound. It's just <laughs> and so, uh, what you want to do, you know, it's a four-dimensional problem. The Earth's going to be in a place, the asteroid's in a place, but it's the time. You don't want the asteroid to arrive when the Earth does, and vice versa. And so, you just want to give it a little nudge, and, and long, by long tradition, it's, in rocket science, we call that a little change in velocity, a little delta V. But you probably couldn't carry enough fuel to do that. And it's been proposed that you make a big, um, a big rocket with um, xenon in it. Then you throw the xenon out the back in an ion drive. And you just, this thing is so massive, how massive is it, that it's mutual gravity with the asteroid would gently tug the asteroid off course. But, uh, it's probably not feasible because of the amount of fuel you would need. It might be, but it's probably taking an extraordinary amount of xenon. Just to move this one, they're talking about it at, at NASA, move one that's just seven meters, which is not really that big. I mean, it, one, it's one that would burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. Just to move that one would take a sixth of the world's annual production of xenon. I mean, I'm not saying it couldn't be done, it's just kind of a hassle. But don't worry, <laughs> we at the Planetary Society are here for you. We've been doing this thing called the laser bees. So this would be a network, a flotilla, a space tilla of uh, spacecraft that would have solar panels on them that would run lasers. Then we'd zap the surface of the asteroid. Zzz, except it's not space. <laughs> then an asteroid would ablate, would, uh, would volatile, would burn off. And uh, you get this jet of stuff, of ejected material, ejecta, and that would have enough momentum to push it. And uh, Alison Gibbons, a grad student in Scotland that's been working on this, she just got her PhD. Yes, Alison, there you go. Uh, she's been doing this, and it works a little better than people thought. Everybody thought that the ejected material would mess up the laser, but uh, it works well enough. So it just, it just one more reason, I don't care about me, it's you. I'm trying to save the Earth for. Now, I mention all this because it's going to be, if we do find an asteroid, it's going to be science, rocket science, and especially engineers that solve this problem. And you got to believe that it's possible. Uh, the speakers earlier were talking about the good old days of the 1960s and the space program. And what we had in the 1960s, and I was a little kid, I had nothing to do with it. We had this crazy optimism, this, this belief that you were gonna get things done. And that's still very much to me in the US, in the American spirit. And I remember, well sure, thank you. Yes. America. I just remember delivering the Washington mm. Post. This is back um, for the students. This is the, News used to come to you on paper. <laughs> it's, uh, it's made from trees and they would print. It looked just like a computer screen, but you had you needed reflected light. <laughs> don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So it's, it's a long time. Ago. Anyway, in the Washington Post, uh, they ran this story several times in Ripley's Believe It or Not. Insects which have been flying for some 350 million years defy the laws of aerodynamics. I mean, it wasn't, wasn't the same insect. I mean, just... <laughs> uh, the bumblebee, considering its size and shape and wingspan, is an aerodynamic misfit and should be unable to fly. <laughs> but even as a little kid, 
I remember going out looking at the azalea bushes and looking at bees. And I realized, wait a minute, the bees fly fine. <laughs> no, your problem there is with the theory, right? I mean, they should be unable to fly. They're flying. Get over it. <laughs> so, well, it just, in my lifetime, it was discovered pro these two key things that bees do that nobody had really thought through back in the Ripley's Believe It or Not heydays. First of all, their bodies are like springs. They pull their abdomens tight and let them go, and they get 40 or 50 <laughs> wing flaps out of every squeeze. Not bad. And then they have these crazy, the, the bees are four-winged flies. They have big wings and little wings. The little wings go back up. They, they, they create some uh, whirlpool of vortex, vortices, that the wings can get back up through. This is Bill being a bee can get back up <laughs> uh, more easily than people thought, which greatly reduces the aerodynamic drag. So those discoveries were made in my lifetime. Just think what will be made in the next few years. I was on the Big Bang Theory which is the most popular show on television. Now wait a minute, you mean the most popular sitcom? No, it's the most popular show, not just the most popular sitcom. And it's about these people who are sort of social misfits, if I may. And so I, you know, fit right in. And, <laughs> and I was on camera with Bob Newhart to the grown-ups here. I just gotta say, I'm this close to Bob Newhart. <laughs> Trying to out dead tan Bob Newhart. <laughs> that may be physically impossible. That may be beyond the pale. So, what I'm saying is, we have to take this optimism. We have to take this uh, passion for science and change the world. I mean, what was the, what was your favorite thing about your favorite professor or teacher? It was his or her passion. He was so, he or she was so into it, right? That's what you loved. We're just, we're that close to being able to change the world. This is uh, me, actually, it's a picture of me. I'm, I'm here. <laughs> On the roof of my house in California. I have four kilowatts of solar panels behind me. I have my uh, solar tube dome here which has these grooves in it, like Fresnel lenses, like in some of these lights, that direct light down this shiny tube, so it's much more efficient, or there's much more light than from a conventional skylight. Because even when the sun's low in the sky, it changes direction and goes down the tube. I still go into the room below and try to turn out the light. It's going on eight years, it still throws me off. And then in the foreground is the solar hot water system right here. This is a zigzag of pipes in a box. People, it's a box. This is not rocket surgery, all right? <laughs> it's plumbing. I mean, who is better at plumbing than the United States? I mean, nobody, Holland. I mean, I'm nobody. Plumb. I want one of you out here to go into the solar hot water business and get rich. <laughs> I mean, we have water, gas-powered water heaters everywhere, and we get this light from the sun for free. Let's get her done, people. <laughs> now, my watch is solar powered, and these, I never wind it. You can't wind it. And these solar panels are about 10% efficient. These are maybe 15% efficient. What if they were 30% efficient, or 40, or 50, or 80% efficient? It would change the world. And what if you were the person who invented it? Or you were the venture capitalist who invested it? Or you're the attorney that allows the intellectual property to be protected so that everybody can get rich and change the world? Let's go, people. This technology exists. Just think of the stuff we haven't thought of. Wait a minute. I mean, think of stuff we haven't thought of. So if we had wind and solar, have you heard that the wind blows around here? You probably haven't noticed. Anyway. We have wind all morning and every night, then we have solar panels during the day, then I drive an electric car, I drive a Nissan Leaf. You put electricity into it, you drive around. In the same way people know where all the toilets are gonna flush during this halftime, 
People know where all the cars are. Engineers know where all the cars are. They're shopping mall in the night, they're at the school during the day, they're at the factory in the morning. Okay, so we'd store the electricity in everybody's car and send it to everybody. And then if you want to get rich, people, invent the better battery. People are experimenting with the hot metal battery. This is where you have molten metal on but the bottom and top is the electrodes. The more electricity you pump into them, the hotter they get and they become molten. It's a layer of magnesium and a layer of salt, like table salt, and then a layer of antimony or antimony. And it's next to tin on the periodic table. You pump electricity into it and this, you store it. So then in the basement of every building like this, of every dorm, at the end of every city block, we'd have these batteries and we'd put the electricity from the sun and wind in there and we just wouldn't need to burn everything. And so then we'd have a smart grid, which you were going to develop, and we can send that on nanotube carbon wire transmission lines all over North America. Would you get it done? So uh, I met Rick Smalley, who discovered buckyballs, Buckminster Fullerenes. Yeah. And he said, it's like the electron falls asleep at one end of the nanotube, has a dream. <laughs> and wakes up at the other end with virtually no electrical resistance. I mean, we're that close. We're that close, people. I want you to figure this out. Now I went to the, do uh, you know the most popular museum in the world is in the United States, it's the Air and Space Museum. It's more popular, more visitors every year than the Louvre, which is, to me is amazing. And that's me, well I mean the picture of me. And uh, there in the foreground is the Mars dial, which is this thing made for getting the colors right in the pictures on Mars. It's the photometric calibration target. But we also messed with it to make it tell time on Mars with shadows. An important task. <laughs> yes, I was in a meeting trying to convince people how great this would be. No, we can tell time on Mars with shadows. Great, Bill. That's great. <laughs> it's a space program, man. Well, Bill, do you speak Klingon? No, it'll be cool. Come on. So if you go to Mars, uh, this is the... Uh, this is the Opportunity Rover. Down in the bottom here is the Mars dial. Uh, it looks like that. And it has a message to the future. This is the first message to the future on a spacecraft since the 1970s, since the Voyager spacecraft. Uh, Pioneer before that in Voyager had messages to the future for somebody out there to get. But this is on Mars. And it's very reasonable to me that somebody in here I just heard his or her voice a few moments ago. Uh, we'll go to Mars and walk around. And in this, on the edge of the Mars dot, in these little letters, it says to those who visit here, which is inherently optimistic, somebody's gonna come here, right? To those who visit here, we wish a safe journey and the joy of discovery. And that, my friends, is the essence of this business. That is the essence of science. That is what drives us. That's why there's so many skulls in that picture. Is our ancestors were driven to make discoveries. If you meet somebody who doesn't want to discover anything, you will outcompete him or her at everything. Ping pong. Uh, pong. <laughs> Total reference. Grand Theft Auto 16, or whatever it is. <laughs> you will outcompete him or her because you want to experience that joy of discovery. That is why we do science. That is why we get up and come to work every day. And it is what is going to, dare I say it, change the world. Now this is a picture of Saturn, and it was put into the Library of Congress in November along with Carl Sagan's papers. And if you look closely, there's Saturn, uh, the main part of the planet in the upper left, and there are the rings being illuminated by sunlight from above and glowing and gorgeous. But right here, this dot, which is a few pixels, is the Earth. That's the whole thing. That's everybody. If we go up there about 100,000 kilometers or so, uh, we get the same view. Uh, there's the sun. And there's the earth right there. That's it. 
That's everybody who's ever lived. That's every oak tree. That's every squid. That's every beetle. Even my old boss, apparently, <laughs> is from there. And uh, when I was in third grade, Mrs. Cochran told us, there are more stars in the sky than grains of sand on the beach. And I just remember thinking, Mrs. Cochran, have you ever been to a beach? <laughs> <laughs> Lady, there is a lot of sand. I'm not kidding. I grew up, you know, back east, we go to Delaware, and you look that way, the first state, the Diamond State, 1,000 nautical miles, 1,500 nautical miles, there's just nothing but sand. Lady, like, no. I would not have expressed it in this way, but Mrs. Cochran, are you high? <laughs> That's impossible. But apparently, it's true. I mean, there's a lot of sand, sure. I mean, the tide goes out, there's more sand. You shuffle your feet and there's sand. You look behind you, there's sand, 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 sand. Little grains of sand everywhere. But there are apparently more stars than all of that. And so I was a kid. I was uh, eight years old. And I'm thinking, I am nothing. I mean, when you look at it like this, you cannot see little Bill standing on the beach. Little Bill is just like a grain of sand. He's just another speck on that dot. So I started to feel bad. I mean, I'm just a speck with these other specks, which are in turn part of a speck, which orbits the sun, which is a completely unremarkable star. There's nothing special about our sun. I'm a speck on a speck orbiting a speck with a bunch of other specks in the middle of specklessness. <laughs> I suck! <laughs> but with your brain, which is only this bit, in the case of my old boss, of course. <laughs> small one. But with your brain, you can know all of this. With your brain, you can use the process of science to make discoveries about the world and our place in space. With your brains, we can innovate. We can experience the joy of discovery, and we can, dare I say it, Change the world!